this uh, new generation with wind and solar is going to big investors in New York that we're also seeing the benefits in our rural communities. Well, it was music to my ears to hear Peter Orzag, the director of OMB, speak of the wind in the Dakotas uh, that we need to get to the other, you know, Minnesota and Iowa. Is this Iowa where Arden. you're going to say you're the Saudi Arabia wind? <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah. So Minnesota and Iowa, to their credit, have been uh, further ahead uh, than either South Dakota or North Dakota in developing their wind. Part of that has to do with transmission capacity, but part of it has to do with leadership at the state level. Uh, as it relates to encouraging that kind of investment. But clearly, uh, when you look at the President's budget, when you look at his other goals, uh, when you look at the steps that even the last Congress took uh, in getting very close to adopting a renewable electricity standard, and then what in, was included in the Economic Recovery and Reinvestment Act with a three-year extension of the production tax credit, certainly I support, I have supported uh, Congressman Tim Walls and his legislation as it relates to making the change on the passive income uh, uh, so that ordinary citizens can get the uh, incentive just like larger developers can. Um, but I think it's important that as we move to a renewable electricity standard and try to get that passed once again, and I think that the votes are probably there now in the Senate to get it done, that we again see clarity on the definition of biomass because that comes up on the renewable electricity standard just as it came up on the renewable fuel standard. And there has been legislation reintroduced in the House uh, that is much more aggressive. Uh, it's 25% by 2025. Many of us have supported the resolution, the goals of 25 by 2025, and part of that coalition. But what got through the House uh, was much uh, was scaled back, and the reason for that is we've got a lot of folks in the southeastern part of the country uh, who claim they don't have enough wind and solar to meet the, the needs, so they want nuclear included. Um, we think that the calculations of biomass that exist in the southeastern part of the country, as well as giving them some percentage break on energy efficiency measures uh, that their utility companies could take uh, to meet the standard be, would be sufficient. But there's going to be another uh, debate and battle again in the House if we're going to try to get to a much more aggressive standard of 25 percent versus the 15 percent. Uh, that we passed previously and allowing a 4% of that to be reached with energy efficiency goals. Uh, so again, I plan to support it uh, as I did in the past, but we're, we're going to have to make some uh, accommodation. I don't think we're going to pass out of the House a 25% goal by 2025. Uh, and finally, with the transmission capacity, uh, and this is again where Minnesota has done a terrific job with their community-based energy development, um, but you know, we have uh, a bit of an ongoing battle with Minnesota as it relates to a uh, new expansion of a power plant there on the border. And, you know, again, we rely heavily on coal-fired facilities throughout the Great Plains. And I understand the concerns uh, that neighboring states or people in other, other parts of the country have about new or expansions of coal-fired plants, although most of these, if not all, that are on the drawing board incorporate new technologies, and I think we have to double down on our commitment, especially if we move to cap and trade. The revenue we get from any allocations and allowances has to be uh, in large measure dedicated toward new technologies and the deployment of technologies, inclu including clean coal. Uh, but when we look at the opportunities that the expansion of certain power infrastructure gives to enhancing the capacity, the transmission capacity for renewables, uh, I would hope that we could find some accommodation to move that forward, uh, but again, I'm pleased that we have a down payment on modernizing the grid uh, and that we can further develop uh, the wind energy potential that we have in, in the Dakotas uh, to ship it, you know, transport it east and west, uh, because those types of economic opportunities uh, are going to be what helps people stay in South Dakota or North Dakota or rural America, because if you stay there, more than likely you're going to be paying some higher utility rates if we were going to move to a cap and trade system. And it's our responsibility, the three of us up here on the panel, working with all of you to make sure that we are treated fairly uh, as that system is, is set up, and that again, some of the revenue from the allowances would go to further modernizing the grid and the type of taxpayer investment that's going to be will have tremendous payoffs and dividends, but it won't be a, until a bit further down the road. I was just going to reiterate the point that uh, Representative Hertz at Sandlin made, and I, I believe we need to do something about climate change. 
um, but that when we do this cap and trade, uh, that we make sure that the, the revenues go not only to the technology uh, that she addressed and that we uh, put that money back in to develop that technology, that we also include the agricultural offsets that she addressed earlier. But the third thing um, was that we make sure that uh, money is also going to go toward ratepayers who are going to see any increase because especially with the economy uh, the way it is and the difficulties people are facing, this becomes even more important. What an outstanding panel. What do you think?